Recently, the Society for Vascular Surgery has decided to sponsor an audiovisual historical archive to feature the outstanding leaders and contributors in vascular surgery. A committee chaired by Jimmy Yao was formed to undertake these interviews, which will help to preserve the impact of our most famous and distinguished colleagues. My name is Roger Gregory, and today I will be interviewing the famous vascular surgeon, Dr. Norman Rich. Norman, thank you for agreeing to this interview. Yeah. You're welcome, Roger. Before we begin, I must say that, that with your host of accomplishments, it's really hard to know where to start this discussion. But <clears throat> let's just start in the early years, where you were born. You know, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be with you today, Roger, and to work uh, with Dr. Yao and his committee for this important historical uh, activity. I was born in Ray, Arizona, and nobody's heard of it. It doesn't exist anymore, so uh, that's a little bit of a challenge for identity uh, crisis, if you will. Ray, Arizona was in what's called a copper belt in Arizona. There are a string of uh, copper mines between Phoenix and Tucson up in the mountains, and it was a Kennecott Copper Company. Uh, it was an underground mine for many years, having been uh, started in 1882, but by uh, 1948, an open pit copper mine uh, took over, and the town quite literally disappeared into the pit. Tell us about your parents. Uh, my parents uh, were both school teachers, and that's probably what gave me the opportunity uh, for what I've been able to do, and I say that because as one example, uh, my high school class had uh, 38 uh, starting and we graduated 10. Everybody else got married and went to work in the mine, but because of my parents' interest in education, uh, I had an opportunity and didn't have to work in the mines uh, my entire life. And this, tell us about the early contact you had with, with cultural diversity. Well, it was very interesting because uh, we had a community right next to us, and there was very much uh, segregation in those days. A community of 5,000 uh, Mexicans, most of them, who uh, were probably illegal in today's way of looking at it. On the periphery of uh, that community <coughs> was a community of Spaniards of about 150 called Barcelona, and they didn't have anything to do with anybody. And then we were on the edge of the White River Apache Indian Reservation, so. <laughs> Uh, we had uh, the Apaches that we uh, played ball against in high school, which was uh, quite a cultural event, as you say. <laughs> and grammar school and high school, this was all in, in Ray? Yes, all in Ray. Now, about this time, one of your early mentors, Dr. Otto Utzinger, appeared on the scene for you. He was my first hero, and when we talk about mentorship, uh, he certainly was my first mentor. He had three sons, and the middle son uh, followed, or I followed his path, you might say, uh, to become a surgeon. Uh, the oldest son had been wounded in World War II and never really recovered from that. The youngest son was a dentist who's still alive today and a very close friend of mine. But Otto Wetzinger, uh, interestingly enough, too, uh, had been born in Astoria, Oregon, was a 1910 Stanford undergraduate and a 1914 Johns Hopkins uh, Medical School graduate who served in World War I. So I grew up hearing stories about all of his experiences, and particularly in World War I, and particularly with all of the amputations that they had to perform. And, it uh, really piqued my interest. Dr. Edsinger uh, gave me many of his medical books even when I was still in high school. So I uh, was literally groomed for what I did. And working in the mines in the summer, I was uh, elected to be the uh, medical officer of the mine because <laughs> I had an, an interest in uh, medicine. And of course, Boy Scouts was a very important part of uh, my early uh, upbringing, if you will. And people like Dr. Edsinger were very supportive of that learning pressure points, uh, and uh, all of those things that we remember from our youth. Now, he suggested that you attend the University of Arizona and to transfer to Stanford. Well, and part of the reason for that is I was given an Arizona scholarship, so my first two years uh, <coughs> were really a free ride. But I wanted to go to Stanford Medical School, and the scholarship uh, 
director at the University of Arizona wanted me to go east, and so I really felt it was necessary to transfer. Also about that time, my father met uh, the president of Stanford, J. Wallace Sterling, and uh, said to me immediately after that, uh, you need to be with that man. And so that's uh, the reason for my transfer. Now, you also went to medical school at, at Stanford, but a little more, Norman, on why you chose medicine. I uh, never thought of anything else. I mean, I wanted to be like doctor, and I say doctor because Otto Etzinger was known in the town as doctor, and if you said doctor, even though there were five or six other doctors, he had the distinction of being doctor, and uh, everybody knew who he was, and <coughs> I really wanted to be like him. Now, for your surgical training, at this point in time, when surgical training was, was on the horizon, there was much political turmoil at Stanford. Well, and you know, even before that, let's say, too, that one of the reasons Dr. Etzinger wanted me to go to Stanford is because Emil Holman had been his mm -hmm. good friend in the undergraduate days at Stanford, and they maintained their friendship. And Dr. Holman, who was uh, William Stewart Halstead's last chief resident, was the first full-time chief of surgery at Stanford. So that's why uh, Dr. Etzinger guided me in that direction. It's also interesting because uh, there was another option he gave me, and that was coming to Northwestern to work with Loyal Davis because mm -hmm. uh, Otto Wetzinger and Loyal Davis were very good friends uh, from the World War I era. And uh, the only other name that he ever mentioned to me and the only other name that I knew in my high school years was Michael E. DeBakey because he said mm -hmm. what he is uh, doing down in Houston is very impressive and that would be another option. But uh, the primary uh, focus was on Stanford, and I was fortunate enough to go there. Now, somewhere in this time frame, you were advised to, quote, get your military obligation out of the well, way. Well, you know, this is because the Stanford School of Medicine, uh, which had uh, uh, existed in San Francisco from 1908 to 1959, moved to Palo Alto in 1959, and that was part of President uh, J. Wallace Sterling's uh, plan for the future, which was very visionary, but it was quite disruptive at that time. Most of the surgeons stayed in San Francisco because they had their private practices there, mm -hmm. and they didn't want to go to Palo Alto. <coughs> so it was a tumultuous time, and as you've alluded to, and as you know, having worn the uniform yourself, we had something called a draft in those days. <laughs> and, you know, conscription was mandatory. So that's why most of my Stanford professors, including Carlton Matheson, who is another uh, a true mentor, uh, had been in World War II, and they all said, uh, get your military service over with, come back, and we'll have everything all straightened out. Well, as it turns out, I had uh, the uh, unbelievable opportunity to be an intern at Tripler in Honolulu, which wasn't bad. It was a, <laughs> a great place to work hard, but when we didn't work hard, we played hard. And at that time, I was offered the opportunity to come back to San Francisco and complete my surgical training at Letterman uh, General Hospital, as they called it in those days, in the Presidio of San Francisco, where all of my former Stanford professors and all of the California professors like Leon Goldman and Jangelbert Dunphy were on the consultant staff at Letterman. So I felt that was the best of all worlds and uh, was very happy with the way that worked out. By this time, you owed some four years in payback. Well, you know, that's, there was always a payback. And, uh, you know, right after I completed my surgical training, I was offered the opportunity to have a sabbatical in Southeast Asia. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> being, being one of the first to be identified uh, to go to Vietnam, uh, uh, Colonel Carl Hughes, who had been in, the world, I mean, been in uh, Korea, called me in and said that General Heaton, who was the Army Surgeon General, had said that I could do anything I wanted to do when I came back. And I had already been with uh, then Colonel Hughes in, at Tripler and Letterman, and I said, well, sir, since you're now at Walter Reed, I'd like to spend one year with you at Walter Reed. And uh, interesting, that was kind of the beginning of the Vascular Fellowship at Walter Reed in 1966, because somebody in the Army Surgeon General's uh, office determined this was another way to get Norm Rich to be obligated for yet another year. <laughs> so that was the start of it. Let's move back to Vietnam when you first went there. Um, 
There was hardly a, a large hospital community there. Well, you know, it was a very tumultuous time, obviously. Our nation was <coughs> divided. There were a lot of unhappy people on both sides of uh, what was going on. We actually spent uh, three or four months at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, waiting for our orders. And uh, we would be lined up on the tarmac at Pope Air Force Base at 0, 0430 hours each morning. <laughs> And somebody would come down the line and say, not today, boys, uh, go back to uh, Fort Bragg. So we'd go back and waste another 24 hours waiting to see what would happen. And part of the reason for that is that the University of California students were lying all over the railroad tracks at the Oakland mm -hmm. Army Terminal, and we couldn't get on our ship to go to Vietnam. So mm -hmm. finally, after weeks of this type of thing going on, they contracted a United Airlines uh, airplane and picked us up and took us to San Diego. And we debarked at uh, 0600 hours on a Sunday morning with a Navy band playing for us and all of the Navy <laughs> families there to see us off, which I still remember very well. And then we had a 30-day uh, trip to Vietnam on board a World War II troop ship called the Simon Bolivar uh, uh, something or other the third, I can't remember now. Uh, but it was, uh, again, a very uh, uncertain time. The rumors that went on, of course, is that the Chinese subs were following us and we'd probably be torpedoed at any moment. <laughs> and uh, the other thing that happened is the only movies we had on board ship were Korean War movies. <laughs> and uh, they'd blow the uh, trumpets, the Chinese troops would blow the trumpets, and then a million of them would come over the hill. So we knew if we ever got there, uh, the Chinese would enter the war and we'd probably all be run over uh, rapidly. So it was a very, very uh, difficult time. They put us out in the middle of the jungle in the central highlands of the Republic of South Vietnam in a little community called An Khe. And uh, we were to support the 1st Air Cavalry Division, which was uh, air cavalry, obviously, no horses anymore. It was all the helicopters. They had 500 helicopters on this big wow. plane that they had uh, wow. made in the uh, middle of the jungle. And the uh, <clears throat> objective at that time was to create a central core and then move the central core out and win over the hearts and the souls of the people around it. Uh, we never really did that, uh, but uh, that's a story in itself. It was uh, a very, very uh, interesting uh, time of my life. Uh, leaving a wife and three young children at home, the only thing I can say is as a young surgeon who was very well trained, I felt very capable and I did what I was trained to do 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There was no interruption because we had nothing else to do. We didn't even have an officer's club as an example. There was no alcohol, there was no uh, distraction, you might say. Norman, most of the professional soldiers that I have talked to actually abhor war. They see very little good that can possibly come out of a wartime conflict. Yet, some look for and find the new pony in the room, and that's what you did with vascular trauma in Vietnam. Tell us about that in the Vietnam well, Registry. You know, it even started a little bit more with wound ballistics, if you will. <laughs> I hunted in Arizona, and I knew something about guns, but I had no idea about the... Uh, uh, missile wounding power of various military weapons. And so I was uh, intrigued with that from the very beginning and my uh, Stanford mentors, Emil Holman and Carlton Matheson and others had said, observe, document and report. And uh, I started by uh, doing this with the missile wounds and uh, the Vietnam Vascular Registry was a part of that because it focused on blood vessels. but my entire time was uh, much uh, broader based and because in our area of training, Roger, we know uh, we took time on neuro neurosurgery and urology and orthopedics and all of the surgical specialties and I had to serve really in those capacities while I was there. I really uh, had the feeling that I knew enough to patch people up to get them to the experts and uh, that was very much a part of my time there. Tell us more about the registry, the, the mechanics of, of Well, how. you know, Carl Hughes had had a piece of cardboard that I saw as an <laughs> intern in uh, Tripler, and he had the names of his Korean War patients that he had treated, and I was always kind of intrigued with that. And then when I saw his piece of cardboard at Letterman when I was in my residency, it even piqued my interest more. So I did talk to him about trying to uh, 
uh, document uh, the uh, Vietnam vascular injuries in Vietnam. And the good news was that I had a lot of support from many people. Uh, uh, something like this is never done alone as we know, and I was merely a scribe for about 600 young American surgeons who served in an eight-year period in Vietnam. But even though we were Army and we were focused on Army, uh, one little anecdote I would throw in, uh, when I had my, my first exhibit at the American College of Surgeons in 1967, the Navy Surgeon General uh, R.B. Brown came by and his question to me was, Major, uh, what uh, do you have against the Navy? And I said, sir, <laughs> you know, nothing, sir. And he said, well, why aren't you including the Navy wounded and the Marine wounded in your registry? And I said, well, I didn't have permission. His comment was, well, you now have permission. And uh, that was uh, very, very uh, reassuring to what was going on. And back to war again, you know, it, you can find quotes, uh, Ambrose Paré, in the 16th century, the French, famous French surgeon said, the only people who gain from warfare are young surgeons. And there's a certain amount of truth to that because in general, as we know, it's been recorded throughout history that there are more of some types of procedures done in a short period of time than in most civilian practices. So uh, that is an aspect of it too. But it was like a Marine Corps uh, general uh, said to me at that time, he said, make something good out of this horrible mess. And the Vietnam Vascular Registry is your chance. So I had plenty of people uh, not only supporting me, but also uh, kind of encouraging me to continue with it. Norman, can you comment on the current status of the registry and what some of your early conclusions were? Well, you know, 40 years on, 45 years on now, and uh, Dr. Frank Veith at his uh, 39th International Vascular Symposium gave me the opportunity to give a brief report at 45 years on, if you will. Uh, the other good news, and I back up for just a minute to say when our country was torn apart over Vietnam, most people didn't want to hear the word Vietnam. So I had a period of about 25 years when it stayed fairly <laughs> stagnant because nobody wanted to bring the subject up. But uh, when we got into the Gulf War, people started asking, well, is this similar to Vietnam? <clears throat> and we began to be able to show that it was or it wasn't, as the uh, interest would be. And when younger colleagues of mine on the faculty would ask me about the registry, I'd say, we never really learned how to do it right, but we learned a lot of things not to do that would make it wrong. So uh, the registering that's going on right now, uh, mainly through uh, the Joint Trauma Registry in San Antonio, Texas, is a marked improvement over what we did, but it'll be another 50 years before the value can come out of that like we have. We have the first uh, hard copied registry of uh, data that's ever been assembled, and uh, the only downside of this, the attrition of the Vietnam casualty, uh, Vietnam participants, 1.9 million, is uh, occurring at a higher rate than ever occurred in, from the World War II or the Korean uh, vintage. I've seen records that show that the, uh, there are only 37 to 39 percent of those people who served in Vietnam alive today. Wow. And uh, so many of them became homeless, so many of them uh, have just died at an earlier age for a whole variety of reasons. Is there a takeaway message from your registry for young vascular surgeons about what the findings were and well you know we're trying to come up uh, again with guidelines we've written a lot of uh, uh, manuscripts on this the book that dr frank spencer helped me write on vascular trauma from his korean experience and my vietnam experience that was supported by people like carl hughes and mike debakey uh, has a lot of that there was a second edition that uh, ken maddox and her Asher Hirschberg helped me uh, with, and right now, because the Society for Vascular Surgery has, quote, adopted, end of quote, uh, vascular Wonderful. trauma, if you Wonderful. will, there is a third edition that's being written by Todd Rasmussen, an Air Force uh, colonel in San Antonio, and a uh, colonel from the British Army in London uh, mm. to bring all of this mm. not only up to date, but also to include the more recent experience uh, that the Americans and the uh, British uh, have had in both Afghanistan and Iraq. And they will also include a great deal of uh, civilian experience. So uh, we think, again, something good is coming out of a lot of bad. The uh, text, uh, Vascular Trauma, has certainly become a classic 
uh, Norman, which I'm sure is an encouragement and, and vindication for what you were trying to accomplish. And I'm glad to hear that it, it also has a modern future. Tell us about SVS members that have volunteered to go to uh, Iraq and uh, other parts of uh, Afghanistan and so forth, and also to Walter Reed. Well, you know, this goes, uh, this goes way back to World War II. There were civilian consultants in World War II as an example for our military. Uh, in uh, both uh, Korea and uh, Vietnam, we had uh, civilian consultants who made visits and who spent a few days in our hospitals. So the concept has always been there. Uh, in the first Gulf War, there were a number of uh, universities that volunteered to send people to help us, even at Walter Reed as an example. Uh, I know the Army best because I wore that uniform, but uh, the Army was somewhat uh, resistant uh, to this. David Gillespie, who was the chief of vascular surgery at Walter Reed and uh, the program director, uh, one of our 1986 USIS graduates, the Uniformed Services University graduate, of whom I am very proud and now a professor at uh, Rochester University came to me and said that he wanted to really push this concept once again and I was a little bit skeptical but I said give it a try and uh, he made it work and it's not just the Society for Vascular Surgery the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma also made the same effort about the same time and we were again a little bit skeptical but uh, Time changes, uh, things change, and uh, it's been a win-win situation all the way around. Because I think it's also been valuable to have many of our civilian uh, surgical leaders see what the young people uh, have been able to do on the battlefields and what they're doing in Landstuhl in Germany because it's been extremely impressive and their results uh, have just been uh, spectacular. And you know, for many years, they feeling has always been lessons learned on the battlefield are brought to our civilian experience, and that's been true. For the first time from my perception, this is the first time that there's been a transfer of knowledge from the civilian community that's being looked at on the battlefield, and that's related to our specialty area of interest, and that specifically is endovascular surgery. Because this has been a rapid development in the last decade, and uh, people like uh, Dr. Todd Rasmussen uh, have uh, transferred this back. It's not mm -hmm. particularly practical. And you know, all wars are different in certain respects. We have had air superiority, so we're able to benefit from rapid evacuation. Uh, we're not having our planes shot out of the air like the Soviet Union had in Afghanistan when the Mujahideen took down their helicopters with uh, surface air missiles, so we've been able uh, we've been blessed not to have that problem. So there are a lot of other aspects that enter into this that we probably wouldn't be able to transfer to the next war. You know, one of the considerations that we had in the first Gulf War, as an example, there were plans for a landing on the beaches uh, in Kuwait and Iraq where projections were that there could be as many as 10,000 casualties a day. Now, this was based on World War II experience. It didn't happen. Uh, many of the planners said, well, we overbuilt uh, the medical support. Well, you know, thank God we did, uh, but the good news is, again, we didn't have to use that. So what I'm trying to say with all of this is that there are similarities, but there are always differences, too. Norman, I want to change gears for a moment <clears throat> and talk about your interest in venous disease. Um, as you know, there are very few vascular surgeons that find venous disease glamorous. All vascular surgeons look to arterial disease. They want to fly the jet plane. But when it comes to riding the turtle, they're not very excited. Yet, you elected to address both sides of the circulation. Well, I kept thinking back what William Harvey taught us uh, in the 17th century. Blood goes in a circle. <laughs> the heart's a pump that pumps the blood out through the arteries, but it's got to come back through the veins. And uh, it just made sense to me that we uh, look into it a little bit more. The other thing that happened when I first came back from uh, Vietnam is that I began to see an increasing number of young men 
with what was essentially post uh, mm -hmm. uh syndrome, and they had had uh, lower extremity major veins ligated. Right. And we also were quite interested in trying to reconstruct some of those, mm -hmm. and people like Dr. Ben Eisman, who uh, Dr. Yao uh, just mentioned at his Northwestern meeting uh, about his start with Gore-Tex. We also got into that because we thought Gore-Tex might be a very valuable conduit in the venous system. So uh, we had a great interest. I have to admit that uh, we uh, couldn't stir up a lot of interest in a lot of other people. And one quick anecdote on that, uh, John Hutton, who was my vascular fellow at that time, who later became President Reagan's physician, uh, used to answer the phone in the clinic and he would say, uh, peripheral arterial clinic. He <laughs> wanted to do with the venous end of it. So it was a little bit of a hard sell. The one thing that really, not only Dr. Eisman's support, but I made a report with Carl Hughes on our first uh, look at the venous injuries in Vietnam to the Southern Surgical Association in 1968 or 1969 at the homestead. And I always remember this because Dr. David C. Sabiston of Duke, who you know very well, was the secretary of the Southern Surgical at that time. And he bolted up over a number of chairs after my presentation and said that he really appreciated my interest in mm. Venus. And he was also interested nice. in Venus. <laughs> so I said, well, I've attached my uh, star to a, a star hero in this uh, uh, effort. Now let's fast forward and, and return to, to Walter Reed, where a strange situation came to pass. While you were doing your fellowship as the first vascular fellow at Walter Reed, you were also chief of vascular surgery. Well, you know, it, it, it's also interesting how these things happen. Uh, when I first came back, obviously, again, I was one of the first who came back, and I had a phenomenal surgical experience. Right. So. I really uh, felt very capable. As a matter of fact, I think, as we know, when we were chief residents, we were probably the best surgeons in the world, uh, <laughs> mentally. And uh, after this wartime experience added to that, I uh, had very few concerns about anything. I uh, really felt very secure. Uh, when I came back, the person who is going to be my uh, chief, uh, and there was no really formulative uh, fellowships as we know, except for right. maybe Dr. Jack Wiley uh, or a few other people like Max Gaspar in Southern California. This is 1966. Wow. So we were kind of on the learning curve <clears throat> with uh, everybody, you might say. And the only reason, again, that it was called a fellowship is I had to be obligated for one more year <laughs> in the Army. <laughs> had to sign the, the dotted line, you know. Uh, the person who is supposed to teach me was sent to Vietnam only a couple of months after I came back because General Heaton, uh, well, again, you have to know a little bit about the Army Surgeon General at that time. General Heaton was a highly respected uh, general, but a highly respected surgeon. He was just a wonderful human being. He served as Surgeon General to four presidents to show nobody else has ever done anything close to that. And there were a few people around him that were called Heaton's boys. Well, I was Heaton's grandson, if you will. <laughs> of this. One of his boys got sent to Vietnam because another one of his boys was killed by a mortar attack in Vietnam. So suddenly uh, there wasn't anybody uh, really to teach, and I was kind of alone with the chief of general surgery, who was a wonderful uh, surgeon. He was a cardiothoracic as well as general surgeon, and he said to me, you need to have your own fellow. So they immediately brought in uh, somebody uh, to be my fellow. It was kind of ironic. I was a major and my fellow was a lieutenant colonel and nobody could figure <laughs> out how I could be in charge of a lieutenant colonel because in the military where rank is everything, you know, uh, that uh, was a little bit in question. But George Lavinson, who was that individual and who remains a very good friend to this date, uh, uh, was uh, very good. So uh, there were three of us, the chief of general surgery, my fellow and me, who actually worked in general surgery as well as vascular to start the vascular fellowship. So now, after all of this time, why did you stay? I know you'd started the fellowship, you'd gone back to Walter Reed, but now there were other offers for you, Norman. Stanford, Arizona, a number of other institutions were very interested in you. Why did you decide to stay with military medicine? 
in reflecting, it's a little bit hard to know. I, I think it's more, Roger, a matter of just how things uh, develop year by year because there was no grand plan to any of this. Uh, as a matter of fact, coming from Stanford and coming from that era, I can't say that I had a great uh, desire to make it a military uh, career. Uh, I had even started in uh, ROTC at Arizona in those days. Uh, if you uh, were in a state university, you had to be in ROTC because the land-grant schools to get money from the federal government had to have those programs. So I was in armored ROTC. This was in the uh, <laughs> Korean War. And we had to watch all these films of what the Soviet tanks were doing to our tanks, uh, which was very unsettling, to say the least. And uh, I was not allowed to continue in ROTC because of my uh, myopia. My nearsightedness was so significant in those days, uh, they wouldn't allow anybody to uh, be in the service. So also, back to what we were talking about with my Stanford mentors, when I realized I had to serve, and then once you became a, a doctor, as you know, they would take you with the one eye. Uh, it was <laughs> a lot different than if you uh, were trying to get in the programs, but uh, the Army Reserve was the only one that would really accept me at that time, and uh, that's why I ended up in the Army. Uh, I didn't plan to stay in. I looked very seriously at going back to Stanford, but I looked at a lot of other jobs. I always remember when John Waldhausen wanted me to be a chief of trauma up at Penn State, uh, and I t had to turn him down. I thought, I'll never get another job offer because the word will get out that I turned out Dr. Waldhausen, but that isn't the way it works, as we know, and no. uh, there were a lot of opportunities. I had, uh, in addition to what you mentioned, uh, opportunities to go to Yale and to uh, yes, I know. Uh, New Orleans and a number of other places. and. This actually continued up through the 1980s, even after I initially retired from the Army. And there was a great pull, but the one thing that wouldn't let me leave, very honestly, is the Vietnam Vascular Registry. Right. Uh, I couldn't imagine not following through. And that became so much of my life that uh, <coughs> that's probably a good reason why I'm, why I'm still there. But the other thing that happened is that uh, Mr. Hebert's dream, the representative from the state of Louisiana that the doctors have an academy much like West Point, uh, Annapolis, Colorado Springs became true when President Nixon signed into law a congressional uh, bill to create our only federal medical school, the Uniformed Services right. University of the Health Sciences. And this is Air Force, Army, Navy, Public Health Service. And Public Health Service, as Dr. Koop emphasized when he was the Surgeon General of the United States, is a uniformed service. So this also piqued my interest quite a bit, and I always remember Dr. Chase at Stanford, who was the chairman in the early 1970s, said to me, well, maybe one day, Norman, you'll be chief of surgery, uh, chairman of surgery in this new federal medical school. And I looked at him and I said, no, sir, I don't want anything to do with that. Uh, so it's also very interesting how all of these mentors became so important to me so many times in my life and how uh, in 1977, when I was officially offered the opportunity to be the first chairman, uh, all of the people from uh, Dr. Saviston to Dr. Holman to Dr. Matheson gave me advice, most of them saying, uh, don't do it. Uh, <laughs> the only person who really said, uh, Norman, uh, you're the person who's going to have to do it, was Dr. David Saviston, who was the chair of the search committee. and. Uh, I said to Dr. Saviston, if I do this, will you be my consultant? And he said, absolutely. And I said, how long? And he said, forever. So this, again, is the change that was coming about in the end of the 1970s. Uh, Vietnam was not forgotten, but things were changing. Uh, when President Reagan became our president, he emphasized uh, stand up and be proud to be an American. Right. So the whole tenor of serving in uniform was changing in the early 1980s. Also, I became very excited about the fact that we were able to recruit uh, very, very bright young men and, and women from the United States uh, to serve in this new federal medical school. And despite the fact that there was a lot of controversy about whether or not we should have a military medical school, uh, we year after year uh, survived and uh, uh, it emphasized that we were uh, contributing something of value to our country. 
This also gave me the feeling that I would be able to continue with the Vietnam Vascular Registry. And although the chairmanship's responsibilities didn't give me time to do that for many years, uh, as I said earlier, uh, our current dean has given me a charter now. And uh, being uh, near the end of the trail, I'm going to be allowed to uh, work on this for at least a few more years. So I think the investment of time for my commitment to the Vietnam Vascular Registry is beginning to pay off. I didn't give you the answer to your question earlier, and I'm sorry about that because most of what we have so far is anecdotal. And, you know, do remember, personal computers really didn't come uh, into being until the early 1980s. I've had the great challenge of not only hardware and software uh, with the Vietnam Vascular Registry, I've been down the primrose path with about six or eight different approaches. And uh, this makes it uh, very, very difficult too. One thing that did help, uh, the uh, David and Lucille Packard Foundation uh, gave me a grant a few years ago to complete the epidemiology of the Vietnam Vascular Registry. So we were able to computerize that uh, more. And, uh, you know, you might say, why uh, David Packard and why do I have a professorship that's called the Leonard Heaton and David Packard Professorship? It's because the former Army Surgeon General and the former Assistant Secretary of Defense for uh, Health Affairs, David Packard, uh, were very instrumental in this new uh, military medical school. And uh, David Packard, obviously, of the Hewlett Packard uh, fame from the West Coast and from much of that other terrible side of the Vietnam Vascular Registry was very committed to uh, the military medical mission. So uh, it is exciting. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. again, Roger, there have been some recent changes because BRAC. Most people outside of the government don't understand what that means, but that's Base Realignment and Closure Commission. And in communities where uh, bases have been closed down, it's been economically uh, uh, tragedy tough for uh, communities and everything, but in uh, June of nine, in 2005, uh, they looked at the uh, Washington Capital Area and they said it's ridiculous to have three military hospitals in such a short area. Let's be more economic. Uh, let's essentially close the Air Force Hospital at Malcolm Grove. Uh, let's take the Walter Reed Army Hospital and move it over to the Navy Hospital in Bethesda. So as of 15 September uh, 2011, physically Walter Reed is now in Bethesda and uh, much to the chagrin of the Navy colleagues, uh, it is called the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda, <laughs> <laughs> which is a lot of words. But integration is working out reasonably well. And the reason I give you a little bit more of this background because from our standpoint in vascular surgery, all of this is supportive of the fact that we have had 45 years of fellowship training. This is the only uh, vascular fellowship program the military has. Uh, the only other one the military <coughs> ever had was uh, for a short period of time, the Navy had one at Balboa Naval Hospital in San Diego, but they gave that up 30 years ago. Uh, the Air Force has just entered into a new O and 5 fellowship program of the University of California, Davis, but. Uh, that's uh, near in Sacramento, and that's going to be a little bit different situation than our uh, vascular fellowship that uh, we hope has a great uh, future. Norman, <clears throat> the highlights in your career are just provide a list that's too long to recount. Hundreds of articles, at least five books, plus thousands of trauma cases that you were personally involved in. In addition to that, you won the prestigious DeBakey Award in 2004, the Berry Prize in 2006, the American Venus Forum Founders Award, Uniform Services Department of Surgery has been named for you, which is startling, the prestigious Master's Medal there's a vascular surgery presentation there at the Peripheral Vascular Society meeting that's now been named for you. You received a, a Senate tribute to honor the service that you had provided the country. And certainly not least, the vascular trauma textbook, which set a whole new standard of assessment of vascular trauma with the Vietnam Registry. 
as well as your interest in surgery and, and surgical history, I'm not the only one who's had problems in identifying photographs and facts about vascular history and history of surgery in general. It's always gone to you to find out the real truth. Norman, out of all the young surgeons that were passing through the military, drafted or, or volunteers, why did you rise to the top? Why, why were you so different? Well, you know, I, we all have our own perceptions of things, Roger. I just try to do my job like you do and like Jimmy Yao and a lot of other people try to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to be allowed to live this long, and I kind of say that too because we all know uh, wonderful people who died too early in life and who didn't have the opportunity to continue doing what they uh, love to do. So I feel extremely fortunate in that privileged position that I have today. Uh, I learned to say a long time ago what has been said uh, for centuries, no man is an island. And we know that nobody does any of these things on their own. And I don't look at any of the recognitions that I've ever received as any kind of personal recognition. I look at it as a team effort because I've always enjoyed having wonderful people around me, wonderful mentors. I, been fortunate to have the same wife for uh, more than 52 years. Wow. Uh, none of our four offspring were ever in jail or on drugs. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's, that's, due to my, that's due to my wife, you know. Uh, we now have <laughs> nine grandchildren. I have, nine, I have six granddaughters that I just love when the three grandsons, you know. So I, I feel extremely privileged. But, you know, having said all of that, and one thing that you and I have talked about before, uh, mentorship. I, I'm so committed to that and feel so grateful. And I've been so fortunate to have had so many mentors and so many good friends. Yes. And in contrast to when I came back from Vietnam, you know, I was afraid to walk on the street in San Francisco in uniform. And I can tell you that along with a friend, we were actually chased in front of the UN building by a group of people who uh, were bent on doing harm to us because we were in uniform. I mean, that was a, a whole different situation. When we started the Uniform Services University, and I mentioned the Reagan era was starting, suddenly there was no one who said no to me. Uh, mm. I couldn't hire a faculty. There were a lot of problems with that. I was the only full-time member on the faculty of surgery at the Uniform Services for five years. Now, during that time, bless his heart, good old John Foster from Vanderbilt yeah. came and helped me for a short period of time. Uh, the person who kind of saved me because I was getting to be very discouraged was Harry Shoemaker, who was one of the earliest presidents, as we know, of our Society for Vascular Surgery, who uh, came up to me at the American Surgical and said, Norman, you need help. And I said, yes, sir, I do. <laughs> and he said, well, I'll come and help you if you can show me that what you're doing is worthwhile. So Harry came and spent some time with me and said, you're right, this is worth it. And uh, he came. A year later, he said, you know, we need to get uh, Charles Robb to come and help us. And I said, well, you know, he's working with Walter Pores down in <laughs> East Carolina. I can't take him away from Walter. And he said, well, in uh, North Carolina, they have a 70-year age limit. He's going to have to stop that anyway. So it's interesting, and it goes on to uh, people like Charlie Huffnagel and Bill Drucker and uh, many other very senior people who had all been chairs or even deans of other uh, medical schools who came and helped us. So I had the benefit of all of this wonderful experience uh, at all times from true gentlemen. The other thing that the dean allowed me to do, which was, uh, I look back at it now, one of the greatest things that could have ever happened, he allowed me to take an associate professor's position and chop it into 50 pieces, if you will, and invite all of the great leaders of the United States and around the world to come and spend a couple of days with me. Well, when they came in, you know, we would get the benefit of their experience, but I would always ask them, what made you successful? Or uh, do you think I have a chance? <laughs> I always remember Steve Wagenstein, the uh, son of uh, Owen Wagenstein, who came after his father came, uh, said, my dad and I have been talking about you, Norman, and yes, there is a light at the end of your tunnel, and it's a train that's going to run over you. <laughs> so there was a lot of realistic uh, feedback, too. But I rapidly say all of this to you because this was uh, academically, professionally, one of the most phenomenal privileged positions that you could imagine. 
The other thing is, and it goes back to uh, Dr. DeBakey you mentioned, he had been the third Army consultant in World War II. And of course, I turned to him uh, even before the school, but with a school, and he said, Norman, you need a board. And I said, yes, sir. So we created what we called a visiting board. This was Franny Moore from Harvard, Michael DeBakey from Baylor, uh, David Saviston from Duke, and equal number of people uh, over the years who met with me every six months to determine what I was doing and to give me advice. I don't think any other chair has ever <clears throat> had this privileged position to be in. Tremendous. You know, so this again leads into all of these various things. Uh, the other thing is because we do represent the nation and we are your other medical school, as we always like to say, uh, we realized we had an international responsibility, so we've always had a very big international uh, program. And uh, the benefit of that has been that some of the young people that I had 25 and 30 years ago now are surgeons generals of uh, Sweden or mm -hmm. Italy or uh, president of the Finnish Surgical Society or the Polish Surgical Society or one of the leaders in the People's Republic of China. All these wonderful international people that I've known over these years and have maintained the contacts uh, with have also been part of this uh, uh, wonderful uh, position that I uh, am fortunate enough to be in today. If you could say there was one single thing that made you a better surgeon, what would you say? I've thought about that because uh, we all think about that. That's an important uh, question. You know, we're so privileged as doctors because we're in a profession that we love. We're in a profession where we can do good. Uh, but we also have the privilege of being students forever. And, you know, there's no other profession that really is built on that type of a background. And I really think uh, the privilege, again, of uh, being allowed to continue to learn is so exciting because I can't wait to get to work in the morning. And, you know, again, Dr. Bakey was just like that, as you well know, Roger. And uh, the last thing he said to me uh, just weeks before he died was, <laughs> grabbing me by the arm with a very uh, firm grip, he said, uh, of course, Norman, you will continue to work full time. And I said, yes, sir, <laughs> Dr. DeVake, you like, what else is there to do? You know, but I think there's another little thing we should add into this at this point. Even my wife today will say, I'm worried about you because you don't have any hobbies. And I said, I, medicine is my hobby, you know? And there are a lot of things, like I've been working 45 years on General Henry Shrapnel, and the fact that nobody gives him respect, kind of like Dan <laughs> Rodney Dangerfield, he gets no respect. Uh, shrapnel is one of the most misused and often used words in the English language. Uh, Basil Pruitt tells me I'm riding a dead horse, but I keep trying to uh, say that uh, I'm going to bring uh, Henry Shrapnel into proper uh, recognition. And that, that, that's my hobby, you know, along with the vascular registry and everything. So I, I really feel, again, very, very privileged. Norman, I'd like to ask you now about some opinions that you might offer for us. <clears throat> the first is, as you know, healthcare in the United States has become quite a political football. Do you think we're losing our way? We have a major problem, and there's no uh, way of getting around that. Dean Sanford, who was our first dean at the Uniformed Services, called me down in 1982. I'll never forget it because he looked at me and he said, did you realize, Norman, that the cost of health care is going to soon outstrip the cost of defense? And I looked at him and I said, no, sir. My entire lifetime, we paid more for defense in our national budget than we sure. paid for anything. So this was inconceivable. Since then, of course, the realization that we've all come to with emerging technologies and you know, at our meetings, just like uh, the Northwestern meeting today with all of the exhibits, with all of the developments, everything costs more. We know that we're creating uh, a challenge for ourselves by driving up the cost of health care. I'm not an expert in this. I listen to the experts all the time, of course. Uh, I hope that they can uh, give us some help. But the kinds of questions, Roger, that we ask ourselves, too, is why are we paying twice what they're paying in the Western uh, countries in Europe and so forth for health care and uh, really delivering uh, no better product in general uh, and many people in our country are not with health care. 
Uh, big challenge. I, I don't have the answers. Let me do add one thing, though, for vascular sure. surgery, because that's why we're talking about this for the Society for Vascular Surgery, where people forget all too rapidly what it was like 30 or 40 years ago. Let's say that we as vascular surgeons have made some significant not only uh, progress in helping our patients and doing the right thing for our patients, but administratively, organizationally, that type of thing. And I say all of this because uh, remember again, uh, we did not have what's new in vascular surgery at the American College of Surgeons until about 35 years ago. Uh, we have not had recognition of our own council. We used to be lumped with the cardiothoracic surgeons and I've seen a lot of these things change during my time. And, as I've mentioned to you and when you and uh, Jimmy Yao and I've talked about this, I said I was pushed into the joint council of the North American chapter of the International Society for Cardiovascular Surgery and the Society for Vascular Surgery at quite a young age in the uh, mid-1970s. Consequently, I was with a whole group of people that were essentially 20 years older than I was, at least, and went through a lot of these uh, very difficult times. I had 18 years on the Joint Council, and one of my jobs during that time was to serve as chairman of the regional vascular committees at a time. That almost tore the Joint Council apart. There were about half the people that were violently opposed to having regional vascular societies, if you will. So I, I just think there are a lot of things, you know. Did we get our own board? Should we have our own board? We know that that was a very agonizing experience for everybody involved too, but as I've told Dr. Veith and Dr. Stanley, who kind of championed that, if they had not made that effort, we wouldn't have the strength of the position that we have today. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think, again, as a profession, uh, we're doing uh, all right, and uh, we have a chance to help make an important contribution to the future because of that. What's your opinion of endovascular surgery? You mentioned, you touched on this earlier, but... Well, you know, let's say that uh, when I was asked by a non-vascular surgeon about uh, this approach, I gave him an article we wrote in the mid-1970s in repairing a couple of vena cavas and aortas that the gynecologists had uh, <laughs> created uh, trauma in their uh, laparoscopic or their endoscopic approach, if you will, with a trocar, but it was a little bit unfair because they didn't have the uh, micro uh, fibers that uh, now we have in the endoscopes and all that type of thing. But let's also say that in our uniform services university international exchanges, uh, General Daniel Reno of the French Army came to me and said, uh, we have this uh, individual named Jacques Parasol in Bordeaux, and he's done a gallbladder a cholecystectomy laparoscopically, would you let him come over here and talk? So we got into the laparoscopic revolution, you might say, very early on, and a natural follow-up to that really was the uh, endovascular. Like a lot of people, I worry about the fact that it was adopted for patient uh, care so rapidly without the usual experimental work, without all of the other things that go on, but I think We've realized that it is the way of the future at this time, as far as we can determine, and uh, it's certainly exciting. I've discussed this with Dr. Juan Perotti many times because when he first came out in 1999 with his information and said this could be used for aorto uh, uh, venous fistulas, I said, Juan, don't uh, do that to us because we are good surgeons, we do good jobs, we get good results, we have good long term follow up. You have something that we don't know what it's going to do, we don't know what the follow-up is. But having said that, uh, we also know that uh, we are learning a lot together around the world and the endovascular is obviously here to stay and uh, it's an exciting addition. But I go back to what I said earlier, having the privilege to live long enough to keep an open mind, to be willing to uh, continue to be educated is one of the privileges we have as physicians. Norman, what's your favorite operation? You know, that would change year by year, obviously. I, I, think, <laughs> I think, again, because the operations changed uh, year by year. And looking back, uh, some of the things that we did that were the most satisfying, I always remember when we went to the American College of Surgeons and watched Jack Wiley and Ron Stoney do a 
uh, an aortic uh, aorto uh, ilio end arterectomy with uh, bilateral uh, renal artery end arterectomies. Uh, it was extremely impressive. We went back and John Hutton and I did that on a patient on five medications for hypertension. Uh, uh, the next day didn't require anything else. I mean, there are things like that that we can wow. all think about. It's hard to say <clears throat> procedures per se. I think it's more related to the experiences that we've had with patients and we never forget those patients. <laughs> um, of all the famous politicians, the famous generals and luminaries that you've had contact with, who was your favorite? There again, you know, it's just absolutely impossible to really select anybody. I've had so many uh, wonderful experiences and being in Washington, D.C., uh, Dr. Saviston, uh, Dave always said to me, there are two groups of Americans, Norman. There are those of you who live inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C., and then the rest of the Americans. <laughs> uh, it's a whole different scene. And uh, it's a pressure cooker where there's usually a crisis, Q15 minutes. Uh, you know, when I had to sit with uh, Hamilton Jordan, who was the White House Chief of Staff, Arnie Rafel, who was second in command in the uh, State Department, along with Omar Torrijos in Panama, who was the, uh, obviously, uh, the bad guy at that time, and talk about what would happen to the Shah of Iran, who happened to be on Contador Island, and uh, what Omar Torrijos kept saying to me in Spanish, because I could understand Spanish reasonably well, and Hamilton Jordan could, couldn't. He said, you tell your President Carter that I should be put on the U.S. payroll because he's using me as a consultant, <laughs> this type of thing. But the reason I say this, too, and the reason that I mention these things, what the uh, President Torrijo said at that time is, reassure the Shah that I won't let him get out of Panama. If they uh, capture him and take him up, I'll shoot the airplane down. These are the types of things that, again, being in Washington, that we get into, and uh, the memories are uh, very vivid and uh, hard to single out. If you had to give advice to young surgeons, young vascular surgeons coming up today, what would you tell them? I would tell them that they have an extremely exciting uh, future ahead and that the uh, uh, opportunity for them to be innovative and to contribute uh, has never been better. Uh, the reason I say this too, we as a medical school are undergoing what's known as curriculum reform. And of course, <laughs> all medical schools have either gone through this or they're going through it. Uh, we've been forewarned that you can make it worse and we may make it worse. But one of the good things that's coming out of this is what has been termed capstone projects. Well, what this means is that our first year medical students are challenged to find a mentor, to find a project and to work on it in their free time, and then they get three months at the end of their fourth year to finalize this project. So uh, mm. I'm very excited about being the mentor at this moment to three uh, second-year medical students uh, in this area. And let me just give one as an example. A second-year medical student who's a Stanford undergraduate, she was in ROTC when Stanford didn't have an ROTC. She went down to Santa Clara in San Jose uh, to do her ROTC. She's, uh, her father was Vietnamese, her mother was uh, Cantonese, uh, Chinese, uh, and uh, she's just a wonderful uh, human being. Uh, she is helping me with the Vietnam Vascular Registry. Ah. She has the project to determine what improvements can be made in managing popliteal vascular injuries. Wow. And the reason we're focusing on this, as we know, in the civilian sector as well as the military sector today, amputations after popliteal arterial trauma are still at about 30%. Right. And we know that there continues to be a great deal of interest over the repair of the popliteal vein because if there's no return conduit, uh, there can be acute venous hypertension and the amputation can be required even with a functioning arterial uh, graft. Right. So this again is the excitement that I'm caught up in and you know as well as I do that if the mentor is enthusiastic <laughs> and caught up in this, the uh, mentee or the students coming along show the same interest. And I have a few others uh, with similar type projects. So I just think uh, it's an exciting time and a wonderful opportunity to still be able to be involved. Norman, 
I want to thank you for this historic interview. You've <laughs> thank just you. been wonderful. Well, thank you, Roger, and I continue to look forward to working with you and Dr. Jimmy Yao on this project, okay? <laughs> thank you, thank you. In July of 2018, surrounded by family and colleagues, Dr. Rich was honored in a retirement ceremony by the Uniformed Services University.